Hello, I'm Claudia Hammond and this is Health Check. Today we're looking at childhood cancer. It's an area of medicine that's seen dramatic developments in the past 50 years. If you live in a high-income country and one day get the terrible news that your child has cancer, there is an 80% chance that with the right treatment they will survive. But take the same situation to a low-income country and things are very different. The child could have only a 10% chance of survival. So in today's programme, we're discussing what can be done to raise these survival rates, and we'll hear from hospitals in the Philippines and Malawi that are trying to do just that. My guest for the whole of today's programme is Tim Eden, who spent his career treating children with cancer and is now Emeritus Professor of Paediatric and Adolescent Oncology at Manchester University. Tim, it might sound like a very grim subject, but let's start with the good news. I mean, childhood cancer has become much easier to treat. In your career, you must have seen some extraordinary changes. Yes, back in the 60s when I was a medical student, the professor of paediatrics said it was quite wrong to treat patients because they all died. And we've gone from little expectation of survival to 75 to 80% cure rates. But we went from fairly cautious treatment approaches, gradually managed to show that patients would survive at first a little time and then with more complex therapy, we were able to increase the survival, decrease the toxicity of therapy, and so you decrease the risks that patients suffered by being treated. And now we've got to this point. We're not satisfied. Obviously, we want to cure 100% of patients, but it has been a remarkable pathway. But the 80% of the children who live in developing countries, low-income countries, middle-income countries, clearly do not benefit from that advance. That's what we're trying to share with them, see if we can do for them what it has taken us 40 or 50 years to to achieve. So what types of cancer do children get? Are they different from what we'd see in adults? Very much so. Adult cancer is essentially a wear and tear thing. As you get older, your tissues get worn out and they've got the changes which develop cancer. And they're most often due to long-term exposure to carcinogens. In childhood, you've got leukaemia in Britain. Leukaemia accounts for about a third of the tumours. And then brain tumours about one in five... And then you've got tumours in the bones and in the kidneys and so on. But these are mostly what we call embryonal tumours. That is, that they're tumours that probably had their initiation when the baby was being put together. So you've got a predisposition there because you've got some tissue in the wrong place. And then at various stages in life, that can turn into an overt cancer. And where do we see the highest rates of deaths from child cancer in the world? In the developing countries. In fact, in terms of deaths... We know that, for example, where I'm going to in Ghana tomorrow, that there's expected to be about 1,000 new cases a year based on the population, but only about 200, 250 get to any treatment. So you're saying that most patients die before they even get to any treatment. Well, we're going to hear from sub-Saharan Africa now, from Malawi, where the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Blantyre is one of just two centres in the country that treat childhood cancer. Through an organisation called World Child Cancer, the centre is twinned with hospitals in the Netherlands and in the UK for help with training and planning. But for some children, by the time they get to hospital and get a diagnosis, it is too late. Raphael Tentani reports from the children's ward. I'm Professor Elizabeth Molyneux. I'm a paediatrician who's worked in Malawi for many years, first came in 1974. And I am looking after the children who are referred to us with cancer. Well, I suppose we see more or less every cancer that children get, but by far the most common one that we see is Burkitt's lymphoma. That probably accounts for about 50 to 60% of the tumours that we see. It's a very rapid-growing tumour. It is, in fact, the most rapidly-growing tumour known in man. It doubles its cells every 24 to 48 hours. And it is associated with malaria, which, of course, is common here. Professor Moreno says the fight against child cancer in Malawi is being hampered by lack of diagnostic equipment in most rural hospitals. Because of this, many patients in far-flung areas try other cures like traditional healers, so by the time they reach the Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital, it is already too late for many children. Professor Moreno says if all child cancer cases were diagnosed in time, most of them could be cured. 
by a simplified treatment which lasts just about a month or so, in which time they have to be in hospital, we're getting a cure rate of 50%. And the total cost of the drugs that we're using is about $50. We've tried various treatments, and the protocols have to be safe, they have to be simple, they have to be ones that don't take too long, because otherwise the family are far from home for a long time. Raphael Tentani reporting from Malawi. Now, Tim, we heard that the main cancer they're seeing there is Burkitt's lymphoma. Why is there a higher incidence of Burkitt's in this part of the world? First of all, this tumour is related to Epstein-Barr virus, the glandular fever virus. But as Elizabeth said, it is very endemic in areas where there's heavy malarial infestation. So malaria, chronic infection, malnutrition plus the virus, all add up together. The immune system is affected, and although patients are very exposed to this virus early on in life, they don't eradicate it from their body, and the virus causes changes in the cells, important blood cells, which lead to that rapid multiplication of cells that uh, Elizabeth mentioned. We see Burkitt lymphoma in uh, Europe and America, but much less commonly, slightly different appearance of the tumour. And yet they're seeing lower rates of leukaemia than in, say, uh, Europe and America. That, that seems surprising. Well, no, leukaemia seems to be a, the reverse picture. Leukaemia starts to emerge as socioeconomic conditions improve, and we think it's some of that that relates to why they get leukaemia in, in the first place. And you've been to the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Malawi. What's the idea behind the treatment strategy that they're adopting? Well, they wanted to cure those people that they thought they could cure, and as Elizabeth said, Burkitt lymphoma is exquisitively sensitive if you can get it when it's relatively localised disease. And therefore you can treat it with a short course of therapy, get it to go away, and you've got 50% of the patients are alive at one year and most of those are cured. If you can treat somebody and cure somebody for $50, more and more patients come for treatment. Now, I can see why you'd start by choosing the cancers that can be easily treated and cured, but for those harder-to-treat cancers, what's stopping people from being able to use the intensive treatments that you might see in hospitals in high-income countries, like higher doses of drugs or bone marrow transplants? Is that just not practical? Well, I think what they're doing in Malawi is a perfect example of how you probably should do the strategy. You build it up. So they've treated Burkitt first, and then now they're trying to treat the kidney tumour called Wilms tumour, which you can also treat relatively cheaply. They also treat retinoblastoma, the eye tumour, and they're just now beginning to try to treat ALL, acute lymphoblastic leukaemia. But the real bottom line is that if you use intensive treatment where you've got a lot of comorbidity, that is malaria and malnutrition, then you end up with a problem of killing patients from the intensive treatment. So the answer very clearly is you have to start gently and gradually build up as you build in the infrastructure, the control of infection and can also afford the medication because it becomes more expensive. Well, we're going to hear now from another twinning project, and this time doctors in the Philippines are using new technology to link up with colleagues in satellite clinics in more remote parts of the country. Dr May Delendo is the only child cancer specialist on Mindanao, the second largest of the 7,000-odd islands which make up the Philippines. She works at the Southern Philippines Medical Centre and she told me the biggest challenges for them are the lack of specialist health workers, the lack of funds for treatment and the geography of the country, which can make it hard for people to access health care. Only 20% of children with cancer get to see a specialist. Many of these families live very far from where we are and just getting on a bus and getting to us is one of the biggest challenge that many of these families face. Sometimes we have patients coming from as far as eight hours away traveling by bus and uh, you could just imagine how these patients are. They're very ill, they're very sick, some of them are bleeding and they would have to survive the trip. What sorts of cancers do you see children with in the Philippines? Every year we expect about 1,000 new cases of child cancer. At least 40 to 50 percent of that would be leukemia. And the rest are solid tumors. We have a lot of retinoblastomas. This is a type of cancer in the retina or in the eye. How easy is it to treat eye cancer? Well, solid cancers 
are actually easy to treat if you see them early. And this is the reason why we focus a lot of our energies also on early detection. What are you doing to try and achieve that early detection? If families are miles and miles away, then how can you make that happen? Oh, this is how World Child Cancer has really helped us tremendously. You could just imagine you are a center smack in the middle of Mindanao and you need to get to children who are far away from where we are. So what we did is we tried to build satellite clinics in some key areas in Mindanao where patients can easily access treatment and where they can be referred to us readily. And we have trained people in these satellite clinics. We have a pediatrician and a pediatric oncology nurse team who man these satellite clinics. And patients don't have to travel all the way to us for them to be seen and treated. Patients whom they cannot manage, they stabilize and uh, send immediately to us. For example, there's this one-and-a-half-year-old child who had kidney cancer. This patient was initially seen in one of our satellite clinics, and he was immediately referred to us. And when he came to us, we were able to diagnose him and plan a treatment for him. And after this, we sent him back to St. Elizabeth in General Santos City, where he lives. And currently, he is ongoing chemotherapy. And it's easier for this family because they don't have to travel long distances to go for the weekly treatments. And compliance has been very, very good. And this patient is almost completing treatment. And you've been using online and video conferencing as well? Yes. During these conferences with satellite clinics, in key areas in Mindanao. They refer cases to us. We guide them how to treat these patients. For example, a child with leukemia presents at our St. Elizabeth Hospital in General Santos City. So what the doctor over there does is do a presentation on PowerPoint. So she takes pictures of the patients, x-rays, does the patient's history, physical examination, and then we discuss this online. And apart from this, we also do email referrals, and she can call me, she can text me, and once in two or three weeks, I go over to see the patients. But the thing is, there's really someone on that side who can attend to the patient immediately. Dr. May Delendo. Now, Tim Eden may mentioned a case there with the family of the one-and-a-half-year-old and said they'd been able to continue the treatment because they could do it locally. How much of a problem is there of people having to abandon the treatment for their children? I think it's huge, actually. The thing is that if the family are very poor, first of all, it's a big struggle financially to cover the costs involved in paying for the drugs and travelling. Secondly, they actually then have disruption. If you take a child to hospital, somebody from the family, our older sister or the mother, has to go. And they have to make terrible decisions about whether they continue therapy or not. So if you can deliver therapy, at least some of it, if not all of it, close to somebody's home, then you actually improve the chances of them being able to complete the therapy. And that's why we're so keen to support May in her development of satellite centres. So for many individuals, these projects will have made a a real difference in these six countries. What needs to be done to make a difference worldwide? The bottom line is that there are maybe 100, 120 countries where you could help or need help. I think that we can collaborate with other people who are doing it. St Jude Research Hospital, you mentioned about May Delendo is getting support from them. They do a fantastic job in many countries. So we're promoting the concept of twinning. But what we obviously want to do is we would like to help many more. We have eight to ten other countries who've asked us for help, but we don't have the funds yet to do it. In a sense, a country is never going to be able to devote the necessary resources to cancer until they've completely dealt with the infectious diseases like TB, malaria and HIV, which are still taking so many resources. Absolutely. There's an inverse relationship between it. As you control infections, up come cancer. I think you've got to do that, but you've got to be ready to start to help as it emerges. Or, as in Africa, you see Burkitt lymphoma despite the fact that they're, they're impoverished as individuals or nationally. And I think that those patients can be cured wherever they are at relatively low cost, and it's worth starting with them. But moving on to more intensive treatment becomes difficult if you can't actually improve the socioeconomic conditions.